Thank you, Perry, for that overly generous introduction. And thank you, Gannon, and thank you all, Jefferson Education Society. And thank you, Erie, uh, for having us here. I'm, I and my colleagues from Europe and the UK, who you'll meet shortly and hear from more fully, are just excited to be here in Erie. Um, it was particularly uh, interesting and, and healthy to be here on an election night and an election morning given Erie's pivotal role in our, uh, this state's and our nation's politics. And whatever political side of the aisle you're on, it was just really nice to wake up and see that our democracy works and our democracy is alive and well. And I'm just really happy to talk about this important initiative that Perry alluded to, this work of accelerating economic transformation in similar industrial heartland regions and in so doing, diminishing the appeal of polarizing and resentment-driven political messages. I'm gonna tell you a very short story, I promise, about how we came to do this work and how we came to be together as partners from the Europe and the UK and the US and how we came to be here in Erie this evening. Um, and then I'll tell you very briefly insights from what we've learned to date from our initial transatlantic convening that some of you participated in of over 150 local and national officials in economic development or structural change, as they call it in Europe, practitioners from eight Western democracies, that was in May of 2021, to last summer's European Union-sponsored discussion with mayors and other leaders from both sides of the Atlantic who shared insights into how best to engage and connect and stay close to your communities, and how to create new paths to economic prosperity for industrial heartland regions. That discussion had 500 folks here and across Europe tuned in to listen and learn. Uh, the short history of how we got to this point, I myself had been working in our Midwest on industrial heartland economic transformation with the Brookings Institution as an elected official, uh, trying to help support policies and practices that could help economic opportunity reach more people in places that it had not uh, reached. And I'm sure that was informed. I grew up in the coal fields of West Virginia. My dad was a Presbyterian minister who took war on Appalachia coal fields uh, postings. And if you've ever been to that part of the world, you know it is a rough and ready part of the world with a lot of poverty and a lot of economic distress. And you know, I remember as a kid, in part, I'm sure, because my parents were in service, what do we do? What can one do to try to help build a better life for folks? Um, well, those of us who are working on this topic of industrial region transformation, that work starting in 2016 took on a real increased urgency that we need to accelerate these efforts for political reasons. The 2016 election saw the appeal of populism growing, both from the left, I mean, Bernie Sanders beat Hillary Clinton in my state and other Midwest states, uh, and Donald Trump obviously won Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. And the support for this kind of uh, populism uh, was coming from the communities that were still in decline. Industrial communities, manufacturing communities that hadn't turned an economic corner. And it was coming be understandably because largely white working class voters, many of them labor union members and Democrats, were responding to these messages of, of nostalgia Let's bring back those good old days when we had high paying manufacturing jobs in our community. Let's bring, let's, let's be willing to perhaps blame others, immigrants, people of color for what ails us. Let's be uh, trying to make America great again, which we all want to do, but that kind of nationalism and, and the kind of resentments that somebody's getting something at your expense, populist leaders often prey on, that you're getting, excuse my French, screwed by somebody. That's the populist message, and it encourages that kind of resentment and, and that kind of polarizing uh, attitude. Um, but I also saw very clearly residents of communities similarly situated, industrial communities in my region, in Michigan and beyond, that had lost their anchor employers, that had experienced traumatic job loss in manufacturing, that had rebuilt and diversified and were growing their economies and their populations, their residents thought and felt differently. They were optimistic about the future. They were positive. They were not responsive to these messages of this polarizing populist uh, rhetoric. And also just prior, the same thing had happened in, in England. As you'll hear about, uh, in the north of England, 
Brexit, the movement to leave the European Union, found its support in the still in decline Northern England, former mill, mining, and manufacturing communities that had, were in decline and had lost their jobs and then the communities were, were deteriorated. Uh, former labor strongholds too, their Democratic Party, their Labor Party, responding to similar messages, including I think the, the tagline of Brexit was, um, you've lost control of your life. People looking for control of their future uh, voted to blame the Europeans and immigrants for those challenges that they were experiencing and those feelings of the frustration and anxiety, which are very understandable. In France, in, the, the, in recent years, growing support for kind of an ethno-nationalist uh, leader, Marine Le Pen, who lost twice to President Macron, but it got closer, gets her support, the Nationalist Party, from the shattered industrial communities of the north of France. And in Germany in 2017, I did see and visit there a more successful effort to manage the transition of their steel and coal region into a different economy and economic future, but it was still spotty and imperfect. And where it hadn't delivered, folks had those similar attitudes of anxiety and resentment. And also in the Eastern European, even though they rebuilt the East European economy, which was heavily manufacturing significantly, there still was that sense that it was being done to them. Uh, and lack of control over their lives and their own destiny. Um, same story across Europe and across the world. In declining industrial regions, that's where there is this growing support for nationalist, nativist parties, isolationism, retreat from the international community. It's, it's true in the industrial Donbas in Ukraine and in Russia itself where the same story, regions where people are experiencing decline. Their life isn't what it used to be, wishing back the good old days, it's the same playbook often run by authoritarians who tap that nostalgia, who fuel culture wars, who prey on the fear of losing one's identity and status in life, and who encourage going with the strong man. The strong man will fix things. So as a wake up call for all of us, we have got to get more serious and active on treating the root causes behind these polarizing populist and nationalist movements that are undermining our own democracies from within, and are blowing up and threatening our alliances with each other, with our friends and allies in Europe and across the world. So we began recruiting uh, organizations and leaders here in the US who shared this urgency and who wanted to help. We reached out and identified who cares about this in England? Who cares about this in, sorry, the UK? England's just a piece of a larger, still, let's hope it hangs on. Uh, the Germany, who wants to help in Europe and across the European Union. And that's who we found, and some of those folks are here with us tonight. Uh, and we decided to link arms and work together to push this agenda in a transatlantic partnership, just as we often work together historically with our friends across the pond, as, as Fergie said. So that brings us here today. In our Transforming Industrial Heartlands initiative, we are sharing ideas and learning from each other on how to do this work well, hence this study trip to learn from you all and us talking and sharing with you here. We're helping our leaders in our nations and our states and our uh, regions reach and be better at connecting and staying close to and understanding their residents and what they're experiencing and to stepping up to take action that helps improve better lives and catalyzes and supports homegrown solutions to economic transition and challenge. And I'm not talk, going to talk about everything that we've learned from these discussions and similar discussions like we're going to have tonight when I sit down and others who know more and from different parts of geography will take the stage. But a couple of things we've learned are one, you know, leaders really have to understand the underpinnings of their residents' anxiety and resentments to empathize and to see things as people in community do the brutal job losses, the wiped out sense of purpose and identity with the loss of those jobs, the degraded downtowns, the loss of the young people, the disappearance of important institutions from schools to cultural institutions to sports clubs and pubs and bars and restaurants, when that's gone, it's felt, and leaders have to understand that. Um, help our communities rediscover these pride, their, their pride. These are proud people and proud communities who are very proud of their history we need to honor that history, their contributions to their nation's economy and success. You know, we learned here more about the Erie story. Your uh, historian, former county executive Judy Lynch, sat us down yesterday 
and said, look, you gotta understand, Erie was the world capital of the, and, and the Erie, Western Pennsylvania region of the oil industry, of the bike making industry, of the zipper industry, of the toy industry, of the boiler industry, of the locomotive and, and those industries, all of these things that help power the economy, created great wealth, look at this building, uh, created good paying jobs, but are also part of that legacy. And leaders and residents need to help each other embrace that history, build on it. We're all proud of the making of things, our industrial history. In the Ruhr, it was the steel and coal region, their arsenal of, of innovation and industrial might. In the Haute de France, in the north of France, we have folks here from that region. Uh, I'm in southeast Michigan, the car capital. Um, Sheffield in the north of England, they invented stainless steel and Cottonopolis, Manchester was the textile, they invented the Industrial Revolution in Manchester. And in Wallonia and Belgium is their industrial heartland region. We're all proud of these identities, but we need to embrace that identity. And then in the words, Birgit Close, who ran Western Michigan's economic development efforts regionally for 30 years, very successfully, said you've got to, and they've evolved from being the furniture city to being a diverse, thriving region. Um, her quote at our last symposium, or maybe it was our first one, was, you've got to look at what you have, build on who you are, take it into the future, and diversify. And diversify means seizing the new opportunity, leading in what's coming, building on who you are and what you're good at. Moving from one trick pony towns, the chemical towns, the steel towns, the durable goods manufacturing towns, like Milwaukee was the machine tool capital of the world for a while, um, into precision manufacturing as you're doing here, the green and blue smart water and clean energy solutions for the world, new mobility solutions, biomedical, new food solutions to feed a hungry world, and IT driven everything because everything's laced with technology and IT in the sectors that are growing and create new businesses and new jobs. And it's gotta be homegrown solutions. Solutions that are owned and operated by local leaders and residents. Change can't be done to community residents, it must come from within. Even well-intentioned outsiders who bring their own prescriptions for economic change can fuel residents' resentments and a feeling of a lack of control of their own future and nurture further backlash. Effective leaders also don't talk down or patronize. Uh, there's a woman in the UK, Rachel Wolf who runs a consultancy, but also has been an advisor to their conservative governments, she spoke and said very simply, look, and has done a lot of listening to their, they're trying to level up in Britain, their ailing, still in decline, industrial regions in the north, meaning equal opportunity, as Germany's been committed to for some time. Wherever you live in the country, you should have the same chance of the same quality of life. But what she's heard from people, is like, look, residents of industrial heartland regions, they don't consider themselves post-industrial, or rust belts, or in need of restructuring. They don't consider themselves left behind. And when you lose language like that, you're off-putting, not drawing closer. They consider themselves ignored. So what leaders need to say to industrial heartland residents is, we see you, we understand why you are so upset with the conditions of your community. You and your community and future success are a national priority. We're here to support and offer resources for you to build your own future. That's our job. And then aid and support community leaders like yourselves in this room to fashion your own strategic vision and blueprint for economic change and support it with enough resources if you don't have it yourselves to get it done. And when that happens, we do see similarly situated industrial regions and communities across the Midwest, across parts of Europe that have turned an economic corner by a variety of paths, there's no one path, by leveraging their own unique assets. When that occurs, it does also change the outlooks and attitudes of local residents. And there's many different paths. There's no right path. Erie has to find the path that works for Erie, that builds on who you are and your own strengths and your own desires and your own future that you want to develop and picture. Some lean into universities learning and research institutes like this one. Other communities embrace a globalized world and build out their export industries or fashion new international partnerships or welcome immigrants as an economic development strategy. 
Still others grow their own green and blue sustainable economies based on clean energy and smart water and stewardship of the natural order, where there's a lot of work and money to be made in doing that well, and new jobs. Manufacturing communities take their expertise into new dimensions and, and to the next level in terms of advanced, high-tech, high-value. Others leverage assets of place, like natural or historical features, like your amazing waterfront or your place in our history and the naval warfare that you helped win, you know, keep us from being taken over by our UK friends who are here again in 1812. Others foster bottom-up, people-led, inclusive growth. Many do a combination of these things. The point is, there's no one path to new economic success for similarly situated historic industrial heartland communities, but there are many paths, and they can be found, and they are being found. And those that do turn an economic corner see residents optimistic, forward-looking, embracing the future, not wishing to bring back some fabled past and our heyday when everything was okay. You know, it really probably wasn't, but that's what we like to think. So we look forward to learning more today and this evening from you and from our visitors and hope that you will be interested in keeping this kind of robust transatlantic discussion going about how we do this important work. So with that, let me introduce Andy Westwood, University of Manchester, uh, professor of government practice and in and out of government. And Andy and my colleagues, come on up to the stage. Andy's going to introduce you all uh, more fully. And Andy's uh, going to lead a discussion with these folks around the different and varied approaches and their own insights into how to do this work well from their particular countries and geographies. And we're lucky to have them. And I've been having a ball um, touring and showing them off some of my favorite communities around the Midwest, like Erie, Pennsylvania. So thank you for having us tonight. Thank you very much, John. Um, you really should go over 1812. <laughs> it's in the past. Um, Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, it's just such a pleasure to be here in Erie. We've only been here two days. It feels like we've been here for a very long time already. Uh, and I think that's because the welcome has been so warm. Uh, people have been so generous with their time. Um, and and it's, it's, it's really felt like we've been able to get to know a lot about you as individuals, a lot about you as organisations, and a lot about Erie. And it's been uh, a, terrific, a terrific privilege to, uh, uh, to do that. So before I introduce my colleagues, I've, I've promised just to say a, a couple of quick things about why, why I've got involved in this initiative and working with John over the last year or two. And, and to be very quick uh, about that, it really boils down to three things. The first is that those arguments, those issues that John has just described so eloquently, our job is to, is to persuade whoever will listen that these things matter. Uh, and that includes people in our communities, people that run our communities, people that run our national governments, um, people that run our international institutions, that this is as big a priority as anything in our domestic and international politics. So that's our first job, and, and all of us that are involved in this work believe that to be the case. Our second job, uh, which is the second reason why I'm interested in this work, is, is that it creates a network of people who are experiencing similar things and who can share their experiences of similar uh, histories, similar futures. And bringing people together in, in that network is incredibly important. And the third thing is, is that by doing that, we think we can understand a little more about what works in places like this. Also, what doesn't work, uh, but we can, we can base our planning and our ideas on how we talk to each other and find out about those, uh, those successes and those failures uh, as we go forward and try to fashion those futures for the places that uh, John has talked about so much. So, like I say, it's such a pleasure to be, to be here in Erie. Uh, I teach politics in the UK, so it's also a pleasure not to be in the UK uh, for a little while. Uh, um, so I'm enjoying my break. Uh, I'm also enjoying uh, working, as John is, with, uh, with so many fantastic colleagues 
uh, from across the world and particularly from, uh, from other parts of Europe. You may have uh, read that uh, the UK left Europe. Um, we didn't really, uh, and we're back together today, so that's a, that's a terrific thing. <laughs> See, we're all amongst friends. Um, so, enough from me. Uh, what I'm going to do is introduce uh, um, each of my colleagues. They're going to talk for a few minutes about their perspectives on these issues and their vantage points from the places that they come from. Um, then I'm going to kind of ask them a couple more questions about what they've found so far in our tour across uh, the American Midwest. Uh, and then we're going to open it up to uh, questions and answers, which uh, uh, Ben, who's at the back, is going to kind of come up and help us with. And at some point in that process, all of you are going to fill out a little question for us. Some of you are going to fill out a little question for us. Uh, and we'll do our very best to, to answer whatever it is you uh, wish to uh, ask us about. So, on that basis, I'd like to turn to uh, my, my first colleague, uh, Benoit Nadler from the European Commission. Can I ask you, ben, to talk, uh, Benoit, to talk a bit about um, your perspective on, on all of the places that you see from, uh, from the European Commission, all of these uh, uh, places and regions in Europe and, and what your, your perspective from that institution is on the challenges that we've heard a lot about already today. Over to you. So thanks. So just for the work in the European Commission, we have an overview, of course, of all European region. Now we'll perhaps start f uh, with some background elements. So <clears throat> as you might know, the European Union has been built uh, over a number of steps. Uh, numbers of enlargement waves. We started with six member states. We picked at 28, and then we're back to 27. We are still candidate countries. So, so um, and this gradual extension has brought together a, a set of region very heterogeneous. So with, um, we, we got uh, a, a vast variety of level of development between Luxembourg region and the poorest region, which is Mayotte, uh, one of the French autonomous region in Indian Ocean with a ratio of 1 to 10 in terms of GDP per capita. We, we have also very uh, agriculture, I mean, uh, um, rural areas. We have also uh, region facing uh, industrial declines. We have autonomous region. We have the northern populated region in northern Finland and, and Sweden. So there's a great variety, much more uh, presumably than, than the US. Um, and the second movement in the EU has been a gradual reinforcing of the, of the capacity of the competence uh, of the EU with major reforms, uh, such as the um, internal market by free movement of person, of goods, of, of services and capitals, like the setup of the European Monetary uh, Union, um, Economic Monetary Union with the setup of the euro air. And what we felt is that those type of reforms will bring a competitive shock between regions, which are unevenly equipped to, 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 to address it. Um, we also have some challenges and future challenges, um, such as the demographic transition, demographic decline, which is quite sharp. We have some member states which have lost already one third of the population. Uh, within member states, we will also um, major demographic uh, trends between capital region and some rural areas which are declining at a faster pace. We have the climate transition. So as you might know, the EU has quite ambitious uh, climate agenda. Uh, but this will translate um, in sharp transformation of the economy, closing of uh, coal mine, uh, decarbonization of industry, i.e. Uh, also closure of industry, which will again um, impact region in a very asymmetric way. Uh, and one of the last challenges is also technical change, globalization, that you have been facing. One of the one, this is one of the reasons of the um, understood of the decline of the steel industry as well in the in the um, in the Midwest, and we are facing the same situation. So all those tensions um, trigger territorial disparities, which are problematic. They are problematic first from an economic perspective because you cannot have a sustainable economic development with 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 a level of disparities. And of course, uh, from a political angle, because this feeling of being left behind um, means that part of the territories, part of the population will, will feel 
will f uh, feel like being, you know, um, yeah, left aside the uh, economic prosperity and the overall political European project. Raising, I mean, uh, in terms, um, polit uh, political discontents, uh, populism, uh, rise of populism, and anti-EU feelings, which exacerbated uh, uh, very tangibly uh, uh, in events uh, such as Brexit. So this statement led to the EU to set up what we call a regional policy or cohesion policy set up in the EU treaty, which is a bit like our constitution for the competence transfer at EU level, where our objective is to um, promote the convergence of region for the reason I mentioned and because of the challenge I mentioned. This is a shared competence between member states and the, and the EU, and, and this uh, one third of the EU budget is dedicated to this policy. So roughly we are talking about 350 billion euros, i.e. dollars, over a seven years period, which, which amount for 0.3% of the EU GNI, just to give you a, a flavor of, of the scale of support. Um, and, and this policy is investing mostly, not excluded, mostly in less developed region. We, and we work, and that's quite important to stress, unlike perhaps what I could have seen from some federal programs, um, it's a program approach, it's not a project, project approach. So the, the, um, we negotiate with regions some long-term, I mean seven years or de facto 10 years uh, programming strategies, um, and we finance a comprehensive set of measures, including infrastructure, human capital, with uh, reskilling, training, um, digital innovation, uh, support to SMEs, um, environment, of course, a lot of, and this is also aligned to the EU agenda uh, and priorities, which are mostly, for the time being, the green transition, so accompanying the um, region is the um, climate transition, uh, air quality, water management, um, waste management, um, with the um, circular economy, and the digital transition, competitiveness, innovation, and so on. So now the question is, um, uh, does it work? Um, the reply is, Yes, but. So there has been a strong conversion mechanism, I mean, uh, progress in the EU. Um, for instance, a big enlargement wave in 2004 when 10 new member states joined the EU. So the three Baltic states, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, sorry, Romania, Bulgaria, but Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, um, Slovenia, Cyprus, Malta, and, 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 and later on, Bulgaria, Romania, and, um, and Croatia. They have, in 15 years' time, doubled, in average, their GBT per capita. Uh, Czech Republic has, has uh, exceeded the prosperity of Spain already uh, in 15 years' time. So clearly, we have a clear catching up process, a governance process. But, but that's uneven. So we have um, success stories such as Ireland. Ireland, when it joined the EU in '73. This was the poorest member state. They are now the second richest one. Um, a, a contrario, we have Portugal, which I joined a bit later, which is still a bit lagging behind. We have the south of Italy, um, which is still dramatically lagging behind despite decades of massive support. So it means that there are some, some, um, some lessons need to be learned. Um, we also have some regions which are what we call um, a fallen in development trap meaning they, are, they, are, they stagnate, they are unable to grow anymore. Uh, we have many of them in France, uh, but also a bit in Germany, in, in Spain, and Italy. Um, and that's mostly because of lack of innovation or insufficient um, education, public governance uh, failures, uh, mostly. Um, so we, um, and we also recently, um, we have been hit, like you, by a, a set of crises. I mean, COVID pandemic crisis, of course, but also the direct consequence that we feel um, of the war in Ukraine, uh, the subsequent energy crisis, and this reveals also an asymmetric um, vulnerability of regions. Some regions have been more hit than others by those crises. Uh, peripheral regions have been hit, of course, by the, or those regions more dependent on tourism have been more hit by the, um, consequence of the COVID pandemic, for instance, so uh, in the need to make them more resilient to future asymmetric shocks in the, in the futures. So 
what kind of lesson can we can we learn? Uh, Repaying to your question, Andy, um, is that money doesn't suffice. Uh, of course, to uh, it's a necessary condition because we have been traveling for two days. Um, there are so many stakeholders hoping to catch a piece of the cake from the federal um, some federal uh, generous uh, recovery plans. That's fine, but that doesn't suffice. Um, and our experience is that uh, we have a set of additional conditions which need to be met. And I will quote, for instance, the fact that you need a comprehensive development strategies. Uh, you, don't, you don't achieve development with uh, implementing a set of sectoral projects, but you need to have a comprehensive uh, vision, a long-term one. Um, you need to build it on partnership, and this is something which is quite critical in the EU program. So we involve partners, um, regional authorities, stakeholders, both for defining the programming over 10 years, but also for the overall the implementation. They are closely involved on the evaluation of programs, uh, on the monitoring uh, of the implementation, and their feedback is always taken into account for, for um, finer, uh, fine tuning the, the, and increasing the efficiency of, of programs. The quality of governance is fundamental as well, uh, of public governance. So the ownership, the uh, need of clear, stable public uh, leadership um, to, to um, accountable also for delivering the, the policy, um, public evaluation uh, mechanism, um, transparency, um, and ethics. Um, it also the need for um, a quality of public administration that goes with things, which is quite quite an issue in some in some member states. Um, and also, this should be accompanied by a mixed by the right policy mix in terms of national budgetary policy, national economic policy, and the right set of public reforms. Uh, you you cannot develop your country even if you receive three or four percent of, of your GDP, as some member states receive from the EU. As, as regional policy, um, if your labor market is not efficient, if you uh, have not reformed your pension, your, your pension system, for instance. And the last point, and we'll conclude on that, is we need also to have a place-based approach. Um, Top-down policy imposed on territories on a one-side-fits-all approach do not work. Um, and I will give you two examples of, of, um, of policy which are a bit emblematic of those place-based policy and targeting in particular the um, region in industrial transition, which is a heart of our debate tonight. So the first type of, of instrument we are developing are these what we call the smart petition strategy, where we invite as a condition for access of fundings um, region to identify their comparative advantage and two or three or four promising sectors, economic sectors, on which they want to invest. And then we have a dialogue with the economic operator. This is identified uh, with a dialogue with uh, stakeholders, university, public authorities, um, um, economic operators, and, and, and social society, like trade unions, uh, so that the, uh, we ensure that the university is providing the skills necessary for the development of the sectors, that the public funding is concentrated for efficiency purposes on, on those sectors. Um, and this is a real driver for economic diversification and, and in economic resilience to, to future shocks. The second and last example I want to stress is that, as I mentioned before, the EU has a quite ambitious climate transition agenda. Um, uh, and it means some territories, as mentioned before, will be hit more than others. In the um, Silesia region of Poland, for instance, we still have thousands of thousands of uh, coal miners which are going to lose their jobs because the coal mine will have to, will have to close. And we will have some region with heavy, even steel industries, or, or which will be easier to uh, sharply decarbonize or even seize the activities. Um, so we have been identified those territories enter a dialogue with member states also to, to fine tune the few territories identified and we created a dedicated financing mechanism called the just transition mechanism um, to make to promote the economic diversification of this region by financing innovation financing the smes in in sectors by the way identified in those smart special strategy which are promising and reskilling the labor force reskilling the 
former coal miners, for instance, so that they can invest in those new activities. So there are two concrete examples where all policy was really tailored and targeted on specific territories facing uh, specific uh, challenges. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Benoit, uh, for, that, for that overview of, of the work of the Commission, but also your perspective on, on the particular issues that lots of different places uh, face. Um, now we're going to move down to, to, to some specific regions within, within Europe, and we're going to start, uh, start with you, Florence, uh, um, from Wallonia in Belgium. So perhaps you could tell us a little about, about that region and the challenges that, that you face in, uh, in that particular part of, uh, uh, of the country. Yeah. So, <laughs> hi to everyone. Happy to be here to, sh to share the, the experience of Wallonia. Uh, Wallonia is one of the three Belgian regions, the French-speaking part of Belgium, so we are located in the, the south of the country. Um, one important point I, I have to mention is that uh, regions in Belgium have strong competencies. So we have um, uh, autonomy in, uh, in the legislation. We have a government, parliament, administration. And so we have uh, strong competencies in economy, in agriculture, in environment, in skills, in research, innovation. So we have the levers to, to influence all those kind of topics. Um, uh, from the, 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 the history, the economic part of, of Wallonia, we were uh, really a strong regions uh, during the Industrial Revol Revolution with coal industry, uh, steel, uh, mechanical engineering, machinery. So we were really strong in leading the, this industrial transition, but we have suffered like uh, other regions of the, the decline of those sectors. And so the situation now is that we are really a dual economy because we are still some strong sectors, industrial sectors, but declining. But we have succeeded in developing new speciali specialization, like in health and biotech, like uh, aeronautics, for example, logistics. So um, we have a really a mix of uh, results. Uh, but still, we are lagging behind. If you look at the GDP per inhabitant, we are below the national um, average or below the EU average. We still have uh, massive unemployment in some part of the, 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 the region. And what is uh, maybe a bit uh, scary is about the, the, um, the unemployment, the, yes, the unemployment among the young people, where we have a, a high rate of unemployment with the, the, the less uh, skilled uh, young people. So uh, we, are really, we have really a mixed results in the economic performance. And maybe if I can also jump to the solution, we try to, to develop uh, really echoing what uh, Benoit was saying um, and my role in that, uh, in that perspective. So I'm uh, working for the regional administration for economy, employment and research and in charge of the, uh, developing the new innovation agenda for Wallonia. So the smart specialization strategy that we are aiming to do uh, for the for the, um, the dialogue with the with the commission so um, starting from the the, the, um, the challenge we we have met in in Wallonia uh, in developing those kind of strategy we have seen that we have a big challenge in uh, transforming money in impact because yes we have money we have different levels but still the impact on growth and in, uh, in the creation of uh, of jobs and so on it it's it's something we are missing something in in the, in, in this story because we invest in research innovation but uh, we are still lagging behind so there we have a really a strong point to to influence one aspect we are dealing with is the lack of startups, of innovative companies, small companies, and uh, deployment of innovative solutions among the, 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 the big mass of SMEs that we have because the, 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 the economy in Wallonia is mainly, mainly done with SMEs and small com companies. Uh, a second aspect that we have seen is that the governance aspect is really important because we have budget, we have money, we have a lot of instruments, so that's not lacking, but still the efficiency is not there. So uh, it's really a matter of 
better organizing the policy mix and the way that everything is swelling to generate uh, better impact in Wallonia. So um, the solutions that we try to develop now, we, we are really uh, in, is this new innovation agenda. We have started a, a totally new journey with the innovation stakeholders, not starting to to try to develop specific sector or spe specific technology, but uh, asking ourselves what are our key challenges in Wallonia and what um, uh, relating, relating to those challenges are the strengths in industry, in uh, research and innovation, and how we can combine that to bring new uh, solution and new innovation on the market. So uh, starting from the demand side rather than the supply side. And so we have um, really had a process of co-construction with all the stakeholders in Wallonia to identify five uh, sectors, areas of priorities. It's not sectors because we try to develop uh, an approach based on cross-sector fertilization, collaboration be between technologies, between different kinds of stakeholders, uh, building value chains, so also linking industry to service industry, so trying to merge different things. Um, so we have five priority areas in uh, circular materials, in health, in agro-food and environment, in, uh, in energy and buildings. So. Um, on, on that basis, we are starting to develop a bit further to, to go from something general to something really specific that can be owned by, by the stakeholders. So we have developed uh, specific roadmaps for each specialization area. And then um, we have launched a call for expression of interest to mobilize all the stakeholders in, in the region uh, so really innovative approach, a call without budget. So we were saying, <laughs> we, we ask you stakeholders to develop your own vision for these uh, challenges, to build a strategy and action plan, to, to have partnerships and to propose solutions that can be the key priorities for the regions. So um, we have now 19 of those uh, you know, innovation, uh, in initiatives that have been selected. And I must say that until now, we are really in a new way of thinking because um, we have selected sectors that are not the usual ones. So for example, so we, are, we, are, uh, we have an initiative uh, to develop um, a vegetal solution to treat brown fields where the, the, the soil are, are polluted to implement new uh, vegetals to, to solve part of the pollution in, in the soil. So it's really something specific because we have a, a lot of, uh, of uh, brown fields in Wallonia and so we will try to bring new solution that also add value to the society and to the economy. Uh, for we, had, we have uh, other, um, other initiatives, for example, in circular uh, economy, where we have strong uh, competencies in metal industry, but now we are trying to build on that to build uh, the circular economy and to uh, make reverse metallurgy, so to, to, to start again <laughs> with the, 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 the metals we have. So it's really an, another way to, to think and to engage the people in the, in the strategy. So we, maybe uh, we can share in some years if the, it's a success, but for the moment it's really promising because the, the energy is there and the, the, the stakeholders are engaged. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florence. It's, uh, um, and, and we should we should say that you've only been here in Erie for a, a few short hours. So uh, we're really pleased you're with us. We're, we're going to move now from Wallonia in Belgium to, uh, to, to Italy and to the Piedmont region in Italy. Uh, so over uh, over to you, um, Tiziana, uh, you're the um, head of unit. You're responsible for uh, innovation policy in your particular area of, uh, of Italy. So can you tell us a little bit more about what that means? Can you use it, this one? <laughs> so um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and thank you for this presentation. In reality, I'm not really responsible for all the innovation policy in Piedmont, but just for a unit that is responsible. It's a new unit. 
responsible for uh, implementing more cross-sectoral approaches, cross-sectoral policies in the innovation and competitiveness policies, because this uh, is, uh, has been recognized, the, the lack of intersectoral approaches has been recognized in our region as a, a problem. Um, but I will arrive to, to this point at the end. Uh, I will just uh, try to give a, a quick picture as uh, Florence has, uh, made on my region that is in the northwest uh, of Italy. The capital city is uh, Torino. You may know maybe this, uh, this uh, town that has been for a long time uh, recognized as uh, the, cap the Italian capital of car manufacturing. And in general, Torino, I would say that uh, for a long time it used to be a sort of, let's say, a, a, a guide, having a, a, a sort of guiding leadership DNA because, for example, Torino is the place where uh, the unification process of Italy born. Uh, the, the royal family of Piedmont became the royal family of Italy. Uh, so we guided, uh, Torino guided this process. Uh, and after having uh, lost this, um, the political uh, uh, capital, because, of, of course, uh, after the unification, the political capital has been Rome. Uh, then uh, he, Torino moved immediately, becoming the first uh, industrial uh, capital of Italy. And uh, for all throughout the 20th century, until the 70s, I would say, 70s, 80s, it, this has been really the, the DNA, the industrial DNA of, of Torino. And this is why after um, the start of the, the industrialization, globalization, declining, industrial decline process. Let's say Torino became a little bit lost in this process and it started this long period that is not at all ended up to now, trying to find other ways of development and um, uh, in the first uh, period, uh, there has been uh, an important and uh, I would say also successful process trying to, let's say, not to um, um, uh, forget our important industrial past, but trying to find another way in, um, let's say, valorizing um, the cultural and uh, urban heritage. There has been a, a huge transformation process in uh, urban transformation process in Torino. Um, we had uh, important cultural investments. Uh, I don't know, maybe the, the Egyptian museum that was already there, but uh, it is now the second museum, Egyptian museum in the world after the Cairo. Uh, other important cultural institutions like the Museum of Cinema, the, um, the Veneria Reale that is a big, big uh, um, investment in, um, in a um, royal palace that uh, leverages a lot of uh, uh, leverages a lot of uh, um, uh, private investment that is uh, recognized as a, a success story in, uh, in uh, Europe. But uh, this is not enough. This is proved to be not enough because uh, manufacturing cannot be replaced by um, these other, let's say, in, um, possibilities of, of, uh, of, uh, um, of development. It cannot just be complemented. And this is why I would say 10, 15 years ago, we will, let's say, started a new uh, era of innovation policy. And now I will go, um, I will try to give uh, an idea of what we would like to we are trying to start in this new programming period. 
because one of the main funding uh, of uh, our innovation policy, as Benoit said, is uh, the EU funding. And uh, um, we are, we are, has uh, said uh, um, Florence, starting, uh, we have, uh, let's say, revised our innovation policy and tried to, by keeping our experience, to find some um, key messages, keywords that are all devoted to the opening, I would say. So opening, broadening, interlinking, connecting, um, because we recognize that uh, we, in, our, in the past, uh, our competitiveness and innovation policy have been, let's say, put in silos, and we would like to break these silos to, um, let's say, to keep and, and strengthen our traditional industrial sectors, but also to, um, uh, also to, to, to mix them with emerging sectors. For example, we have still automotive in our innovation agenda as one of the main sector, but it is open, open to, in general, not only automotive, but in general, mobility, sustainable mobility issues. We have aerospace, that is another in, uh, traditional industrial area, but we also have all technologies, solutions, uh, and materials related to green processes. That is uh, in a very an emerging sector. We have also life sciences. And we also would like to push a lot to interlink, uh, to, to create interlinking with this, uh, among this, uh, this sector. Another point is uh, very important for us is uh, to um, help our SMEs that are the vast, the major 99% of our, let's say, composition of companies is made by SMEs without uh, the, the big companies that were in the first industrial era. The SMEs need really to be accompanied and we developed uh, some Mm, say uh, mm, tools uh, and uh, policies that uh, they're trying to help uh, SMEs to to progress and to become to become stronger, to work together and let's say to to, to grow. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, we have uh, an important program of innovation clusters that help are let's say there to help. Uh, SMEs to do that. Uh, we would like another important point for us is would like to work more on universities to connect, uh, let's say, to, to, to connect universities with uh, the companies. And one of the one of the most important thing that I have learned uh, today, yesterday, in these first days. Uh, in the uh, United States is at this point, uh, universities uh, here in the uh, United States uh, really work with the communities, uh, with the, the companies. Uh, in, in this, uh, I think, is uh, the right approach. In Italy, they are more as uh, scientific, highly important scientific uh, institutions, but they are not used, they, they are, they, don't feel so, so strong this mission of working with the companies and, and we would like really to develop this aspect. It's a, also, it's a question of, of culture. It is not easy to change this mood, this attitude, but this is one of the things that we would like to do. We would like also to, to do many other things, but I cannot <laughs> explain everything now, so I, it's worry. better that I stop. <laughs> Absolutely fine. Pass me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tiziana. We're going to move very quickly from Italy to Germany. Uh, so, 
Uh, Michael is going to tell us a little in a few minutes about uh, um, what the Ruhr feels like, the Ruhr Valley, big industrial area of Germany. Over to you, Michael. Tell us a bit more about that. Thank you. Um, the first uh, coal crisis was at the end of the 1950s. The first steel crisis was at the beginning of the 1960s. So we're talking about 60 years experience with structural change. Uh, structural change that we didn't order that happened due to the economy, due to the market conditions, etc. And uh, this headline, Reunivating Industrial Heartlands, Healing Polarized Politics and Strengthening Western Democracy, is a political question. And uh, there are many questions, many answers necessary around uh, structural change, but if I would try to give one is that we have to take responsibility. And that means we have to make a good job. And uh, if we are going on with international compare, this means we can look what are the experience of others and we can see that others have done a good job more or less, etc. And that's where we can exchange and learn from each other. And a good job in the context of a regional policy and regional structural change is it's a regional task. It is something that we have to do sustainable. It is something that we have to make just. Everybody should benefit from that. And it must be resilient and it must be also a cultural job. Um, our lessons learned, and I would just put some, I'd just take some, is the first would be structural change is change in many fields and at the same time. That makes the thing so complicated. Uh, and we cannot choose to do it one after the other, so first, we fix the sites, then we make the urbanism, then we come to the culture and then to the environment, etc. No, structural change is change in many fields at the same time. And that means that we have to incorporate so different entities, so different professionals, so many different uh, administrations, etc. interests. Uh, so the second thing is structural change is always a long term. And we have experienced that not only because the first coal crisis was in the 50s and the first steel crisis was in the 60s. No, we, we have experienced this with all these sites. It takes a minimum 15 to 30 years to bring an old industrial site back to the city and back to the economy. If somebody tells you this has been done in five years, be careful. Um, the same thing, if we, we know that we have to be better or different, that we have our different skills, that our kids should get a different uh, education, then we're talking again about a whole generation. Having new schools, new curricula, etc., means 30 years until we say, yes, we are fit to this. So structural change is something coming from changing business, changing economy, changing world market conditions, etc. To be fit to these new conditions takes, and if we look backwards in these in the old industrial regions, we have also had 30 years or 40 or 50 years to be these strong steel industries or to be the strong chemical industries following the coal industries, etc. So also our former uh, colleagues used and had a lot of time to be so strong in this field. Um, the third thing is uh, it does not need only investment in the hardware. It only needs, also needs investment in the software. And I mean the quality of management that we are joining or that we are steering or that we are managing these processes. So it's very important to look on this uh, skills that are necessary uh, to manage these complex processes. The fifth point is public sector goes first, private sector follows. Um, we have experienced that and a lot of politicians in Germany wish that immediately the new economy moves in and invests and makes the things. No, the repair work has to be done with 
public money. The new companies do not invest in the mistakes of the old or gone or no more existing uh, economy. So there is a, a clear combination that if the public sector goes first, he has the initial power and initial impulse that is a good thing to manage or to steer the directions. Special tasks, very banal, need special instruments. So if, for example, if we want to manage this uh, cleaning, cleaning of industrial sites, etc., we need special tools that we get a result that is sustainable, that is relevant for the neighborhood, that is, uh, in that way, a just development of the site, etc. So revolving funds, etc., things like that have been tested, have been trained, etc. So uh, for special conditions, for special tasks, we need special instruments. We have experienced that it is quite interesting to have a strict combination between strategies and projects. And I'm not mentioning a plan. A strategy is a clear direction. What kind of qualities do we want? And maybe we do not know the single steps in the sense of a plan. But we can choose good projects where we can prove if our ideas of the strategy are okay. So this answering between do we have the right goals, the right direction, do we have a fitting strategy, and can we prove that in projects is an interesting key for learning strategies. And this means that we're not having a, a, a master plan and then we follow in one, two, three, and then we're ready. But by following this idea, we have to learn project by project. The next, what we've learned is this regional uh, attitude, this regional manage management of these complex things needs trust. That sounds banal, but uh, if two mayors work together, sharing the methods, sharing the problems, etc., uh, they have to trust each other, that they benefit both from these things. And trust, again, is... Uh, Creating trust is creating experience, and that takes time. So when we're talking about working of neighborhoods, working of neighbor politicians, or if we're speaking about public, uh, um, private cooperation, then trust uh, is a, a very th thing. Um, I'm coming to the end. The phases of structural change is a unique phases in the history of your city or your region. A place is getting empty because the old use is gone. Brownfields are a problem, but brownfields at the same time are a unique spatial potential for change. Uh, in the ready, running, well-equipped city, there is no place. Every place is already, uh, the houses are there, the cities are there, the streets are there, the institutes are there, the train tracks. So uh, this period of structural change is a unique, historical, unique phases uh, to do things different. And this means you can place housing where, where there was no housing. You can place new urban landscape where there had been no parks and no landscape, etc. So it's only once in the history of this region. And it's after 30 years, the, all these sites will be used and this chance is gone. My last remark is we have to include climate change and energy efficiency much more than we've done it until now. So that's in the moment a new challenge. And uh, it's nothing, again, it's not, not something what we can do by the way. Yes, we, we will look for the climate. No, this climate change things and this uh, energy efficiency question need new answers. So we have to concentrate on the innovations in this context. And looking on Erie, there is the lake. You have a unique thing, and that's the lake. So uh, the question of Erie's structural change is, what do you do with this, with this interaction or interrelation or the potential uh, 
for example, in sense of climate change and uh, energy efficiency. Thank you very much, Michael. I think we're going to move straight to Ben with, uh, with some questions for us. Um, and we'll try and give you, depending on the questions, quick answers. So, so first, I, I want to thank the audience for being here tonight. Second, I, I want to thank the panel, and I, I want to thank John, because tonight, if nothing else, we've put global in global summit. So how about a round of applause for our panelists? So, so Andy, you read my mind. I, I told you before uh, going up, we have a thoughtful audience. We have a, a ton of great questions. Uh, I'm going to try to read them as best as I can, as fast as I can. Andy, if you can help me air traffic control these to maybe one panelist, maybe the full group, if they're not addressed to somebody specific. Uh, John, there are some questions directed at you. So we're going to figure out a way to get you back on stage with a microphone or standing next to me. So and go. So the first one is, is a really big one, and I want to start there, which is what is the single most, uh, uh, the, the single greatest achievement in innovation that has occurred in your area or under your jurisdiction? Oh, right. Who wants uh, uh, single? So we're going to keep this brief. What's the most, most important thing you've done in the rural, Michael? We funded five new universities in the 1960s, where there have been no universities before, and today we have 250,000 university students in the Ruhr. So we are the biggest uh, uh, education site in Germany for higher education in universities and University of Applied Science. So funding five new universities in the 1960s was a long-term investment, and quite an investment, and it's, it sells. Excellent. Shall we? Florence? How many universities have you got? <laughs> yes, it's okay. We, we started to invest in biotech uh, also some years ago, and now we are really successful in that. And I, yes, the message is that it's long-term investment. So we have to be patient to, to see the results. But we have selected that sector in the past, and now it's really flourishing. And we also can build now in developing new innovation niche in that sector because we have the new gene therapies, we have different uh, developments, but also trying to innovate in the uh, educa in the health system to, to make those, those, the, those solutions uh, affordable for the people. So it's also a, a way to innovate over okay. that. Thank you. Tiziana? And uh, in Piemonte, I would say that we invested, uh, it is 20 years that we try to invest in uh, uh, reinforcing the, uh, the, the, the area of facilitating innovation to support, uh, uh, to diffuse innovation and support SMEs. First, uh, with the industrial scientific and industrial parks uh, that are places where, where companies can go and try assets, uh, infrastructure, research, etc. And also with the people, so innovation clusters that can help, that have uh, innovation, innovation managers, innovation facilities, and can help uh, SMEs to, to, let's say, to uh, have, uh, in the, make innovation. Come back to you in a bit then, Benoit. I, I'll just add for us in Manchester, it was creating a mayor. Huh. You say what that means? We created a greater Manchester mayor, right? A regional mayor. We created a, a regional body uh, that covered Manchester and a number of towns around it, and a mayor to run the whole thing. And that's only seven years old. So, so picking right up on that, somebody's asking about regionalism, and this is both, and this is why I brought John up, uh, is that it's both in context of the U.S. in context of uh, uh, Europe, uh, that regionalism seems to work, if what we're hearing, it, it's working really well with physical borders. How do you go beyond physical borders? And, and I think the person asking that from the U.S. perspective is thinking, we don't have a whole heck of a lot of borders here, but how do you transcend literal borders between countries to develop a regionalism? John, if you can start us in the U.S. perspective, and then we'll kick back over to the, uh, to the international panel. 
Well, I think um, part of it, and Michael probably gave the best illustration, um, even though, and maybe you got it from the discussion, even though we're often using different language here and in Europe to say the same thing, meaning we're talking economic development, they say structural change, they talk about competencies, you know, we use other language, our abilities. Um, but when I saw, I went to the Ruhrgebiet, which is that uh, Ruhr coal steel region, which has how many municipalities? 53. 53. And they started, as he said, 60 years ago saying, how do we move from out of coal and steel and make sure people have jobs and our communities transit and thrive? And they thought ahead and did things like, yes, let's place universities and research institutes as future fulcrums for baking a new economy. And so I think what we, and I hope you got even from the discussion with the language differences and the accents, we are very, very similar in our kind of industrial economic storyline and profile, the industries that made us great. And so we can learn a lot from each other across international boundaries about what did you do in the Ruhr or in Wallonia or in Northwest Italy. I don't know if you caught Tiziana, it was the car capital, Torino, Fiat. They, just like at GM World Headquarters in Detroit, they had a racetrack for their cars on top of their corporate ancient building. What was the Ligonato? from the 30s? Right, so you know, you go to Torino, you're seeing the look feel of Detroit down to the architecture where they race cars around. And so the, the learning about similar approaches and different approaches that people are trying to help the evolution of these very similar uh, regions can be done and that's you know, why we're here. Benoit? Yeah, we have some concrete examples in the EU where we have also been promoting what we call uh, transregional cooperation. So, uh, and a bit, a bit, what you, you may be doing in the in the in the lake with, with your neighbor, for instance. So, uh, we identify a, cert, a certain geographical areas with common features, common challenges, where there was a need for transnational cooperation. Examples: the cooperation in the Baltic Sea. You, you have all the Baltic states, you, you, uh, you will have um, Finland, you will have Sweden, you will have uh, Poland, uh, and they have common issue in terms of weather management, pollution, maritime control, uh, transport. Uh, we have common issue on the Danube. Uh, on the um, Danube is one of the major uh, river, as you know, in EU, but it involves uh, countries like, like uh, Germany, Austria, uh, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria, and so on, and, and facing common issue in terms of inland navigation, uh, water pollution, and so on. So, because they face common challenges, and in more, much more difficult situation because they don't speak the same language, you have different financing capacity, different administrative capacities, we, we, we steer a process where we had create, we created ad hoc commission, uh, providing the financing, um, identify the challenges, identify some strategies, uh, and they manage to work together and to achieve uh, and to achieve the objectives required by the challenge faced together. Um, I just want to say something about borders that's a bit different. Um, working across borders is the hardest thing to do. I think our temptation, whether it's between countries or between organisations or between regions. The easiest thing is to say, let's make this border stronger. <laughs> let's, let's defend against, let's defend our interests against their interests. Let's outcompete them. And, uh, and in economic terms, and often in social terms, that's a mistake. Um, it's, but it's really hard to go from wanting to protect your borders, in the UK's case, to take back control of your borders. That was the slogan. Um, when it's really clear so much of the solution is about working across borders within our own organisations, within our own regions, but also between regions and countries. And it's, it's actually the hardest thing to get right. Um, but if you can get it right, it goes back to Michael's point about trust. If you can get it right, the, res the rewards are, are, are much, much more significant. Um, because you don't turn in on yourself, you turn out. Uh, conquering physical borders or political borders, uh, administrative borders, etc. It's all the same. It's you have to have common interests. You want to share interests. So it's not a trust in the sense of a behavior. It is understanding. 
maybe we have the same problems, and maybe also we can develop solutions. And then it's very practical thing, it is to organize the cooperation. It has to be organized. It's not just come together and be nice or be cooperative. No, the organize, the heads, and there are a lot of knowledge exists how this can be done. And one very simple is concentrate on the subject. Don't speak about all the others and don't speak in general of if these two cities should merge or something like that, then it's chaos, yeah? But if you can concentrate on the subject, on the problem or the interest, then step by step solutions can be developed together. And by the way, trust uh, is being built, it's, it's produced. And real quick by way of encouragement, this cross-pollination can happen, is happening and just even happened in the last day or two. So we went to, um, the Gannon University IHAC, the innovation stuff here. We went to Penn State Barron, where you've got uh, the innovation labs, you know, undergraduates working on projects for companies, uh, getting intellectual property, patents, getting jobs. Um, both Benoit and Tiziano are saying, I wish we, could, we couldn't do anything like this in France. You know, and it's like, well, you know, you'll go back and you'll figure it out, because that's why you're here. So, you know, there's, there's lots of inspiration and seeing how to do things that we're all trying to do with a different model. So uh, as a proud alumni of uh, this institution, Gannon University, I hear those bells and I know what they mean and it's almost Pavlovian for me to react. So I know we're almost out of time here. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm gonna do uh, three things. One, I'm gonna tell you a terrible joke. Two, I'm gonna do some housekeeping notes. And then three, I'm gonna ask a final question to our panelists, which I'll telegraph to them now to say, uh, so many of the questions up here, I think I can put them all together to ask the question of what at this moment, the night after an election night for the midterms here in the United States, what most makes you hopeful for the survival of democracies, which I'll ask that third, that'll be the last thing I do. So the terrible joke first I'll tell you is, is, is one, uh, what do you call somebody who speaks three languages? Trilingual. What do you call somebody who speaks two languages? Bilingual. What do you call somebody who speaks one language? American. I'm that bad American. So, I, I am in awe of our panel and their ability to talk through such complex issues with us tonight, not in their native tongues, and, and do that just hours after they've really seen a full day's worth of Erie, Pennsylvania. So I, am, I, I owe a debt of gratitude to John for putting this together, Andy for or, organizing the panel, and panelists for you doing this. Thank you so much. So, so I said number two, housekeeping. So housekeeping, we are right back here tomorrow night. Uh, we have uh, the Fallows, our towns, coming in to talk about how small towns are writing the future of this nation. We'll be exploring that uh, with them tomorrow night, 7.30, right back here. Uh, as Ferky mentioned, and a big thanks to him and the entire team at the JES, uh, Friday we are up at uh, the Jefferson Educational Society for Reverend Charles Brock. All next week we are streaming programming from Redlands. If you are curious how to stream that for free, head to our website, jeserie.org. There you can find helpful information or you can find one of our helpful staff around here to make sure you get logged in to see those four programs to check those out and of course a huge thanks to our team our board of trustees all of our sponsors including tonight's sponsor the Erie County Gaming Revenue Authority Dr. Perry Wood thank you so much for what you do for economic development here in Erie all of our sponsors our host here Gannon University that was number two number three what makes you most hopeful about the survival of democracy today Who's first? <laughs> Don't all jump in at once. Uh, I would say the people, because uh, what I've seen today is a lot of people engaged for their communities, for the region, for the, for the, the commonwealth. So I think uh, it's the people that can make the things happen. So, yeah. Benoit? Well, one of the things which impressed me the most um, since I arrived in the US a few days ago, I mean, both here and in Pittsburgh beforehand, it's the ability of um, even citizen initiative uh, foundation, like your foundation, uh, which is something quite unknown in Europe, by the way, to actually fill the vacuum left by the absence or lack or insufficiency of uh, public leadership in, in tackling. Uh, issue we have been discussing tonight, for instance, in the region development. And this kind of bottom-up 
civic society uh, initiative, it also uh, uh, quite, quite uh, uh, brings a lot of hope in their capacity to, to deliver. Thank you. Michael. Of course, with uh, with Florence and with Vimena, with, I will add the institutions, so the democratic institutions, because they are, let's say, the the, the, the backbone of a, of a democratic uh, nation, both here in uh, in the U.S. but also in uh, in uh, in Europe. So, I, I think the democratic institution proved to be resilient to, let's say, changes, and because we, we set the clear rules for governing uh, democratic institutions, and this, this is the right rules. And democracy is uh, producing solidarity. Democracy is producing and handling diversity. Democracy is sharing interests. It is incorporating the weak. And it creates the future for our kids. Uh, well, let me, let me try and answer that by saying uh, I doubt everyone in this same room thinks the same way about politics. I doubt everyone in this room voted the same way if you voted yesterday. I doubt everybody, even on this panel, has, on this stage, has the same view about everything. But I think the thing that makes me most optimistic, and I think this is a tribute to the Jefferson Educational Society, is that we can all come together and we can talk about things and we can talk to each other. And, uh, and it's by doing that that uh, we create a better future for places like this. And if we develop that up and time that up across all the places we represent, then we create a better future for all of those places too. And I think that's a, that's a cause for real optimism. I get, I get the last word. So your comment about uh, speaking well in our non-native tongues, does that apply to Andy and I? Uh, <laughs> it, it, it may appear that way. Um, <laughs> We're attempting to speak English, I believe. But, so I, get, I chose to interpret last night's results, um, and it gives me uh, heart that it appeared that the voters in their collective wisdom seem to be discouraging those who might seek to unravel democracy and reward moderates of both parties who want to support democracy. And that makes me feel good about democracy. So thank you. Yeah.